we are changing how we pave our streets, how we power our cities, how we move our people, and how we construct our buildings. We're fundamentally trying to rethink how we do the business of cities. And uh, we found ways to change what we do in our own operations. I, at least I've found that many of us have. But we've really struggled, I think. Uh, I certainly have observed. We've really struggled with trying to get that behavior change into our residents. We've, uh, we've done all sorts of things, like this, this, uh, this program here in Vancouver. We launched a curbside composting program a few months ago and spent a whole lot of money trying to figure out how to get people to use it. How do you get people from different cultures to think about separating that waste and not put it into plastic bags so it can actually be composted. I have been a part of, in my work in Chicago and in Vancouver, um, the expenditure of millions of dollars trying to affect behavioral change among our residents. And uh, I'm not sure I have a success story today. I guess I want to tell you a little bit about the experience that I've had and, and my observations in that, because it's been very frustrating. It's been very challenging. In some ways, I feel like we as municipal workers aren't really equipped to make that kind of change among our residents. So we've done programs like this one-day program in Vancouver, and you go to Starbucks and your disposable mugs has the one-day logo and tells you all sorts of things that you can do. And we've given away a lot of shirts. And uh, many of us have been involved with a lot of great campaigns that come up and everyone gets excited and they kind of fizzle out a year or two later. And I was in uh, the Chicago airport a couple of days ago, or yesterday, and I saw the logo from a program in one of the recycling containers that we launched years ago. I was kind of like, oh, that logo, I remember that. But it was like a lot of money went into that logo. <laughs> so um, from a national front, you know, this is a one-ton challenge in Canada. Take the one-ton challenge. This disappeared a few years after it was launched. Again, not a lot of uptake. We started to read the studies and learn people are a little bit more interested in saving money in the pocketbook and making decisions based on that. So when we launched our climate change plan in Chicago, we launched our $800 savings challenge. Do these things. Click on the ones that you want to do, and we'll tell you how much carbon you save, but we'll tell you how much money you save. And our goal was 50,000 people would take it the first year as of meeting that part of our challenge, and we didn't achieve that goal. And in the city of three million, we spent money, time, and energy trying to promote this. So getting people to, to take these challenges, to make these, these commitments, to take little actions in their daily lives is, I think, a real challenge for us as cities. And I'm, I, I would argue that we're not currently equipped to, make, uh, to make, uh, give the tools to our residents to make these, these changes. Vancouver, though, I, I recently moved there and, and uh, was interested to see that uh, Vancouver has... Um, kind of bucked the trend there a little bit, not with a lot of these smaller programs, but with an actual shift in behavior from their residents. This is our greenhouse gas emissions from 1990 to 2010. We are currently below 1990 levels across the entire community. So we've, uh, we've seen a shift happen there. So I was starting to wonder whether we as cities could make this happen. And then I stepped back a little bit and saw these numbers and looked at what had been done in Vancouver and then compared it to the rest of Canada. So you see Canada is kind of continuing to do what it's been doing as, as a country. And then you see around 2000 when Vancouver adopted our climate change plan, you see a shift. We started to actually go down. We've affected change. We've gone down to 1990 levels. We're uh, expecting to exceed Kyoto level reductions by next year. So we're, we're going to be one of the few, I think, that are on track to exceed that. A lot of that is for, for things that are bigger things. They're not necessarily behavioral change things. They're, they're clean energy from hydro. They are district energy systems. This is a photo of our district energy system where we take waste heat from the sewage main that's going down through a neighborhood. We take the heat out and we heat the entire neighborhood. So residents in that neighborhood have a 67 percent lower greenhouse gas emission profile than people uh, outside of the neighborhood as a result of this. So there's a lot that we've done in our infrastructure, but there's a lot of behavior change that's happening as well. And I want to talk about a couple of the things that I've seen that have actually driven positive behavior change, the kind of thing that we want to see happen. And the first is around our transportation plan. Our 10-year transportation plan about 10 years ago said we're going to reprioritize things. The first priority now is the pedestrian. And we're going to make the city accessible and our public spaces are going to be beautiful and we're going to make it easier to walk around. Then we're going to go for bikes. We're going to, we're going to prioritize bikes. We're going to start taking away car lanes. As uh, some of us have, have discovered, um, that can be a real challenge. The cars don't like taking lanes away. But the bikers do, and we've seen uh, some significant results in adding bike lanes to our big bridges going into downtown and our main streets through downtown taking traffic lanes away and adding beautiful separated bike lanes. So seniors are now saying, I can bike downtown. This is the first time. And kids are doing it as well. That's fine. Okay, so I'm wrapping up. 
So at transit, again, 50,000 riders. Um, what we've seen here on this behavior change is 180% increase in, in biking, 44% increase in walking, and 50% increase in public transit ridership. So we can affect change by designing these communities. And what you see in downtown, as I go into my last minute here, is uh, we've managed to get, they have managed to get 60,000 people to move downtown in the last 10 years. So the city, you're actually seeing people are making those decisions to live in a smaller house so that they can be in the middle of things, be in the middle of, this is the uh, Olympic celebrations, so be in the middle of all of that activity. To live in a smaller place, a smaller uh, square footprint, but you actually get a lot by being there. We're taking those, those abandoned industrial areas and bringing them back to life and creating dynamic places. So I guess the thing that I want to leave us with here is that people will make behavioral shifts. They will make those changes, but I don't think that those changes are going to come with us putting out a logo and, a, and an ad campaign. They're going to come by us working together to create dynamic, beautiful places that are transit-oriented, that are exciting, that they want to be in, the, the decisions that they, they want to make. So Vancouver currently has the lowest greenhouse gas emissions per capita in North America. We have managed to come down and exceed in exceeding Kyoto with uh, still 27% growth in population since 1990 and an 18% increase in jobs. So what you're seeing is you, you get an increase in jobs and a decrease in climate. You can actually do that but it's by all of us working together to help make that behavioral shift happen. And I want to close with this, that we, we are constantly, in this field at least, we're, we're, we're just overestimating what we can do in, in a year and, and totally underestimating what we can do in five or ten as we, as we make this change happen. So thank you very much.